Hello, Janksters, and welcome back to another edition of the Magic Jank Podcast, the weekly show where members of Team Magic Jank get together and talk about the latest happenings in Magic the Gathering. I'm Hamox42, and I'm joined by the one and only C. Favreto Jr. Carlo, how are you doing, man? Hello, hello. I am doing fantastic. How about yourself? Oh, no complaints. Yeah, so we have some stuff to discuss today, and we're going to kind of just jump right on into it, because fortunately, we don't have any crazy news, no big scandals that we need to touch on, at least none that we're aware of yet. We'll fi- not this week. You know, not this week. Well, there will be more, sure, uh, in the future, I have no doubt. But we are in the midst of preview season, and we're going to be previewing cards from, well, we are previewing cards from Murders at Karlov Manor. So this set is going to be interesting, and... I don't know. We've seen a lot of cards. And so the plan today is to kind of discuss those, break it down. We've grabbed a number of them. And knowing myself, I know I'm going to be very long winded. So at this point, who knows how long it's going to be. But strap in, everybody. We've got we've got a commute or two covered for you here. It is preview season, baby. It's preview season, baby. Oh, yeah. You'll love to see it. So this set is, this is the murder mystery set, if you haven't been kind of paying attention. So the whole idea, there's also a clue crossover. We're not going to get into those cards in this episode, or at least we're not really planning on diving too deep there. But they have a whole separate supplemental set that's eternal legal, but not going into standard with a whole bunch of, um, you know, clue properties, which, okay, that's fun. But we also have a ton of new stuff coming to standard as well as, well, every format, because that's usually what happens when things go into standard. Um including a whole bunch of new mechanics as well as a a whole new card subtype. And so I kind of want to get started with that, if that's okay. Of course. I know, right? So this set is murder mystery themed. It's all about trying to find who killed certain guild leaders on Ravnica, which we're talking about a plane where people come back as ghosts all the time. So I don't quite know why the tension is. Are they really dead? Yeah, and, and on top of that, hundreds of people die in the Carnarium, like, during the Racto Circuses, like, every night, so, I, I don't know, but, hey, it's fine, whatever, it's fine, let's not, let's just not think about it, and instead, let's solve some, some mysteries, and let's solve some cases, yeah. so, we have a new enchantment subtype in Case, so this is kind of an interesting design, it's kind of like Sagas, but different, in the case, the way a case operates, it's, it's an enchantment, And it has kind of a chapter one, kind of its default state. And then you can accomplish a certain criteria. Once you meet a certain criteria, it becomes solved. And once it's solved, you get an additional bonus, which sometimes is an activated ability. Sometimes it adds like a passive. It can do a number of things. But basically you have default state, which provides some value to kind of justify putting the card in the deck. A solve condition that you need to execute. You need to solve the case. And then once you do, there's a reward. So... The case here that we have is Case of the Filched Falcon. This is the example that we're using for this discussion. There have been a number of these. And you'll notice they're um, they're vertical in the way they're presented, very similar to Saga's. Except in this case, the art is on the left and the text is on the right. I'm also not a big fan of the margin, but that's a not a it's that's a little nitpick for um yeah. In the in the case here, like uh, the the T is touching the art. Why is that anyway? Yeah. It, sorry, it doesn't really matter. That's a minor aesthetic nitpick. With Case of the Filch Falcon, it's an enchantment for a single blue. When this case enters the battlefield, you investigate. So, one mana, you get an enchantment on board, it creates a clue token. All right, decent on rate. Sounds great. To solve, you control three or more artifacts. So, the way that works is on your end step, if you have three artifacts, a triggered ability will go off saying, hey, this case is to be solved. And it is an ability on the stack. It can be stifled, you can respond to it. You know, if that's on the stack, you can bounce this or you can, you know, you can do all kinds of stuff. Additionally, if you remove my third artifact and the condition is no longer satisfied, when this case goes to resolve, it will fizzle. Just like if you have a spell that is targeting a creature that all of a sudden has hexproof. Same situation. But then if this resolves, the case gets solved. And in the case of the Filched Falcon, in the case of the case of the Filched Falcon... I shouldn't have grabbed a word teaser as the our example case here. <laughs> Once the case is solved, it gets an ability. Two and a blue. Sacrifice this case. Put four plus and plus one counters on target non-creature artifact. It becomes a zero zero bird creature with flying in addition to its other types. So you mean to tell me that the clue I put into play on one, mm-hmm. I can then make it into a four four attacker yes. or blocker? With flying? That's exactly right. I don't know, right? That's and a filch falcon that. indeed. 
I know, right? You get you get a falcon. It's uh, and this is clearly a Maltese falcon kind of reference, uh, which nothing wrong with that, right? I think the balance on this card is interesting because you need to have three artifacts in play in order to get to the solved state. Obviously, it only costs one, and it puts one artifact into play. It spots you one. Yep. So if you don't crack the clue, and on turn two, you can get two other artifacts onto the battlefield. On turn three, you can sacrifice this and turn one of those artifacts, even the clue token that you got to begin with, into a 4-4 four, four bird. If that didn't enter the battlefield this turn, it can attack. So you can be attacking with a 4-4 four, four flyer on turn three, in an artifact heavy deck because that counts even artifact lands and things like that if you're in formats yep. where that's available so honestly i do think this card is just a really solid little role player in artifact themed decks and the f the floor on it uh is one you get a clue this deck you know, or this format cares about clues all over the place do you know what other one blue card currently makes an artifact that, that is the spyglass siren from uh ixalan for one blue, it puts a map token into play. So if you play this thing on turn one or the siren on turn one, mm -hmm. and then turn two, you play siren number two, and then the case, you know, on the third turn, your mm -hmm. map or clue might be flying in the air and attacking for a bunch of damage. I mean, as far as a tempo strategy is concerned, wow, I hadn't even really considered that, but you're right. I mean, those tempo decks are running... Those the sirens that are producing the map tokens, and they even have the schooner in there, which you know obviously oh, it's yeah. not going to get you the bird on three, but it's an artifact. It counts, you know. So in plenty of games, that might be the third. Yeah, that's interesting. Interesting. Well, oh wait a minute, and non-creature artifact, you could use this on a vehicle if you wanted to. You could. Granted, in the case of the the schooner, you only get the benefit uh, if a creature crewed it. So. Mm -hmm. That, that one isn't as great. But there are plenty of uh, vehicles out there with attack triggers. Oh, yeah. Where, you know, this as an alternative to that, if you don't have any other creatures, for example, to crew it, you could do this. I don't know. There's, it's a cool card. I, I think it, this is cheap enough, and it does just enough that I wouldn't be surprised if this sees play. Yeah. Good stuff. All right. So the next card I want to talk about, we're going to be talking about another mechanic. We have a new mechanic coming in uh, in the name of Di or by the name of Disguise. So Disguise is actually interesting uh, because it's probably going to sound very familiar uh, for folks out there. If a, if a card has Disguise, you can pay three mana and play it as a face-down creature onto the battlefield, which is a colorless 2-2 with no name and no type. But it has and, Ward 2. Yeah. And Ward 2. <laughs> yes. That's huge. And listen, a couple of my friends and I, we talk all the time about how many cards now in this game have Ward 2. Legit. Mm -hmm. Right? And how we don't really see any cards with like Hexproof or Shroud anymore mm -hmm. in comparison to Ward. So this is just a strictly better morph, no yep. matter how you see it. Right? Um, and this card is a 6-2 Menace. So I can cast this face down, potentially protect it from, like, a go for the throat or a cut down for a turn. Mm -hmm. And then I just got to pay two mana the next turn to flip it up, and I've got a 6-2 Menace. Um, yeah. That then doesn't give my opponent any creatures, as is the Hunted fashion. Indeed. So, yeah, with Hunted Bone Brute, it is a 6-2 Menace for two and a black. So, obviously, a 6-2 with Menace for three mana... You know, a lot of power, pretty fragile, but interesting stuff. But when it enters the battlefield, target opponent creates two one one white dog creature tokens. So you're giving your opponent the answer to this creature, which is often the case with the hunted creatures, right? And so obviously in, in Commander, you have situations where you can give them to one person to kind of curry favor. But mm -hmm. in a 1v1 environment, that's a massive drawback, you know, because all of sure a sudden... Is. Yeah, being able to attack with six power with this evasion is great, but you have two chumps that you spent nothing on that can easily answer this. Mm -hmm. It's a bummer. Uh, but then when it dies, each opponent loses three life, so you get to kind of pop them on the, on the way out. But obviously, if you spent three mana, attack once, they lose two creatures and three life. Like that, That's not a good exchange. You're, you're not coming out on top there. Uh, but this is another cheap creature that works really well alongside fight rigging and oh, yeah. to your point if you disguise it first the end of the battlefield trigger never happens that does yeah. involve a total man investment of five so that 
it's one of those scenarios where if you're really depending on that, if you need to have this, you'd get disguised first in order for proper value, then I, I would seriously consider, um, you know, considering it during the, the deck building as like a five drop. Yeah. You know, d d definitely think of it that way. Don't think, oh, I've got this three drop right here. If you're never going to play it on three. Yeah. Uh, but if and you know, yeah. it's 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 interesting you mentioned fight rigging mm -hmm. um, because Mur Murders at Karlov Manor is the first set that they took into an account when building the set. That mm -hmm. standard would be that increased three year rotation rather than two. Um, so you'll actually see a couple of cards in this particular set work really well with cards from like Innistrad Midnight Hunt and Crimson Val. Yep. Um that, you know, as opposed to like cards from Ixalan, which mm -hmm. weren't, it just happened so we had a six six dino for three mana. Um now we have up to eight six power creatures that we can play uh a turn ahead of time. Um mm -hmm. and then fight rigging into to get some payoff, which is pretty nice. It's bonkers. Yeah, so uh, fight rigging fans Yes, it still works. We can still do stuff. Hooray. Yeah, nothing but love for that. But yeah, so Hunted Bone Brood, it's an interesting design. And uh, yeah, and so you can flip a face up with your disguise cost. There's also another mechanic in this set that you'll see. I didn't grab up um, a card specifically for this, but I want to call it out here that goes alongside disguise in Cloak. So if you're familiar with Morph already, we had Manifest, where you can take a card from a place usually from like the top of the deck or from your hand yep. and put it onto the battlefield face down just as a morph creature. And then you can turn a face up for its mana cost. Cloak is the exact same thing, except the face down creature has ward two. Yep. And I think that ward is really important because creatures have become so much more powerful in general that a vanilla two, two for three. But can you imagine just trying to play a vanilla two, two for three in standard right now? Yeah. You're going to get it, destroyed. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. It's going to get cut down all over the place. Go for the throat all over the place. Mm -hmm. Now you ain't got to worry about that. Nah, it, it, it's going to protect itself a little bit. And then on top of that, it's kind of fun too, because if the opponent does have a go for the throat, you know, or a cut down, they now have to spend two additional mana and it might not be worth it depending on what the face down creature is. So it puts them in this weird position where it's like, okay, do I really want to get rid of just that 2-2? You know, obviously if they hit a big mythic disguise creature, okay, they're going to feel great. But if you just got them to spend four mana and take turn four off to play a go for the throat to get rid of, I mean, meaning no offense, our hunted bone brute friend here, okay, <laughs> I'll take totally that. Totally cool, yeah. Yeah, not bad. So good stuff. All right, next up I want to talk about Collect Evidence, which is another mechanic that we're going to see in this set. Um, with Collect Evidence, it functions very similarly to Delve, and we see it appear in a bunch of different places. So it appears on a number of cards as kind of a kicker, where if you collect evidence, you get an additional effect. And yep. we also see it as a ward, at least in one case, where if someone wants to target this thing, they need to collect evidence. I love in the order word to collect friends. evidence, you need to exile cards from your graveyard, up to a certain, up to or exceeding a certain mana value. If you need to go above, they'll let you. But, um, yeah. And so the card that we have here is the Axe Bane Ferox. This is that four drop, powerful, aggressive green creature that makes us wonder: Is Mono Green back? Still no. But this, or this, this card's not going to get us there. <laughs> Someday, Why not, though. <laughs> Someday. Honestly, though, this one is pretty good. So the Axe Bane Ferox is a 4-4 four, four for two green green with Death Touch and Haste. And Ward collect evidence four. So if the opponent wants to hit this with the cut down, or the, well, not the cut down, but the go for the throat, they have to exile four mana worth of stuff out of their graveyard. If they have a lot of instants and sorceries, that's probably not mm -hmm. going to be hard, but it is a real cost. Yeah. You know, there are plenty of situations where maybe, um, you know, maybe a control player has farewelled and they've blown up graveyards. You know, granted, there's the farewell in the graveyard, but that's about it. If they're in a situation where the memory deluge is the only way they can get, you know, satisfy four, are they going to exile that to try to get rid of this thing? I mean, that that right. hurts. You know, that that's real. So late in a lot of late games, unless you actively are hating on your opponent's graveyard, which honestly is probably a pretty good strategy with this thing. Uh, if your opponent has a graveyard deep into the game, that's probably not going to be very significant. But in the early game, that might as well be hexproof in many matchups. Right. So <laughs> I like this. Yeah. So yeah, for I sure. I mean, collect evidence. I'm I'm not going to call it here that it's better than Delve. What? But it might be. That's I mean, if, especially if you're playing a deck with higher mana value cards. 
Mm-hmm. Seems great to me. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty powerful effect. And uh, they balanced it pretty well, I think, on the cards that we've seen it. So, good stuff. Uh, then we have another... Which I'm real another mechanic that I'm realizing I didn't have a card teed up for, so let me type that hastily. Uh, we have what are called. Oh wait a minute, I do have, I do have one. I'm over here being being <laughs> unprofessional. Don't mind me. So the next mechanic that I want to talk about is suspect. Oh yeah. So suspect is a type of mechanic that I don't know. It's it's different. We've seen the role enchantments. As, you know, from um, Wilds of Eldraine, it kind of reminds me of that. But it functions very differently from a gameplay perspective. So, Suspect is a status that can be granted to a creature. Uh, similar to Face Up, Face Down, Transformed, Not Transformed. Um, yep. Yeah, uh, Exerted. Those kinds of effects where it's not necessarily or doesn't untap during their untap step prior to stun counters. That was the whole thing. Yep. So, it's not a counter. It's not an aura. But a creature can become suspected. If they are suspected, I believe there might be some cards that say a suspect. But in any event, if the yeah. if this is if, if this little yeah. toggle is on, that creature gets menace, but it cannot block. So it's interesting. There's a reason why you would give it to your creatures to obviously make them more evasive, but there's also a benefit to giving them to your opponent's creatures. Oh yeah. That way they just straight up can't block. So nice defender you've got there. Not anymore. It's a really interesting mechanic. You know, you you talked about it in terms of how it's like exert from mm -hmm. back in Amonkhet block. You know, and exert never was a counter, but nope. if if y'all that have been playing Paper Magic remember, um, you could either use the little punch out that they gave you for this to say that the creature was exerted, or what most people did is they just took their card halfway out of the sleeve and they said, <laughs> okay, my card is exerted. Fine. Y'all remember Glorybringer? Me and you are friends, right? <laughs> so this is sort of a characteristic that's like exert, uh, so that your card is suspected. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what's going to be the fancy way we denote suspect in Paper Magic. Because um, it can't be the same as exert. It's got to be something else. Yeah, they will um, have punch cards. They're, they will yeah, have oh little yeah. punch outs. So like under your pre-release kits and stuff, they'll probably, and in packs, there will be little mm -hmm. punch outs that have like a little spy versus spy caricature yeah they'll probably have it on yeah, the pre-release boxes um probably they're yeah. like the outer box for you to just have them so i'm sure they'll have them in those or the bundle boxes yeah i'm sure i'm sure yep. those punch outs will be there um but yeah so they do have that so that's something but there's got to be a shorthand for that right like there, sure. there's got to be and actually i'm curious now that you mentioned glory bringer and that that kind of tabletop shortcut for exert mm -hmm. i wonder there's no way for me to verify this, but I wonder if there are like copies of Glorybringer on the secondary market because that card saw a ton of play. I'm wondering if the the cards on the secondary market are um, more damaged and like have like little transforming yeah, yeah. edges from just sliding in and out of the sleeve more. <laughs> it might be. <laughs> anyway, I, I, we'll never know. But if you have a Glorybringer and that's and you see a little, little more dings on the edges of those than others, that's probably what's going on. Oh yeah. So the card that I want to talk about when it comes to suspend is a card that I have a lot of feelings on. It doesn't add up. This is an this, this is three black black return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Suspect it. Now the the card type on that if you hear all that you think oh this is probably a sorcery. That's what I did at first too. But this is an instant. And so instant speed reanimation is a big deal. Big it big is. big 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 deal. And I think it's really clever to use instant speed reanimation alongside the suspect mechanic. Because one of the most powerful ways to use an instant speed reanimation effect, of which we've seen a number of them over the years. I mean, even in standard right now, we have Graveyard Shift. It's got a little overshadowed by Cruelty of Gix. But the situational flash on that reanimation, you know, if, if you've ever had an opportunity to reanimate a large creature into an attacking board state... It feels really good. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so you mentioned Cruelty of Kicks, right? Because that's like yes. the go-to five mana reanimate spell, mm -hmm. but it does other things, right? It does other things. Exactly. Yeah. Imagine playing like the Rakdos ramp deck and your opponent has just go for the throated your Atali Primal Conqueror. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, great. I can attack now. And then you're like, no, hold up, uh, five mana instant, reanimate Atali. Oh, by the way, let me get a removal spell off of one of our decks, mm -hmm. off of the Atali for free. 
Exactly. Uh, maybe I can block something else. Like it, <laughs> this card seems great. So yeah. what? My Itali has menace and can't block. Uh, the menace seven seven trampler is gonna love that. That that's uh, savage. You know. But- yeah, Atali's an interesting case with this. I think that's probably, like, the best example. Because, mm-hmm. like, okay, the Atali itself can't block. That is a notable downside in that scenario. Yep. But any creatures that it spins into sure can, so... <laughs> I'm, Trump, I'm trumpeting fine. Carnosaur re-enters, discovers five, like, or, discovers or the, uh, it doesn't add up and reanimates another one. Like, <laughs> sounds great to me. Or Yeah, or the dream is you have, you know, yeah, you spin into another Atali, so you keep the Jeez. one that isn't suspected. Now it can block. Like, you could, yeah. The, the sky's the limit with this thing. It's a lot this of fun. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, re- and, and, I'm gonna go buck wild with this thing when it comes And can out. we take a moment to appreciate the, the style of these oh. cards? Um, I know for those of you who are listening to the podcast on non YouTube platforms can't see the card, but this is the special sort of showcase art for some of these clue cards. Um, that's getting a, a, deeper look into the action of the regular card. Um, so it's it's really interesting to see these this way. I think it, this is wonderful artwork, wonderful border mm-hmm. of a card. Oh, I, I could not agree more. Yeah, it's depicting kind of this this circular frame, almost like a magnifying glass that we would associate with kind of a classic Sherlock Holmes style mystery with, you know, the event unfolding. And in this case, we have, a, you know, a Trotta looking confused and out of sorts, which right. as I understand it is relevant. And it was funny too, because like the normal artwork is also great. Cause I mean, yeah. it's magic art. Of course it is. Uh, but I had to bring up the showcase art for this one. Cause it's just, mm-hmm. it really pops, you know? Oh, yeah. So good stuff. So yeah, so that's suspect. And we see that in a number of different ways. Um, oh, and once a, once a uh, creature is suspected, once it is a suspect, the only way that it can be no longer be a suspect is if a card specifically says that, it stops being a suspect or if it leaves the battlefield and comes back because then it's considered a brand new creature. So, all right. All right. Cool. 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 So the next thing that I want to talk about is the lands. We're getting a new rare land cycle because it's a set of magic cards. So we're getting a new rare land cycle. Dual lands. Indeed. And all 10 in the same set of the same cycle. First of all, great. Keep doing that. If you're going to release these cycles of lands, just give it to us all in one set. Yep. This is fine. Nobody's going to dislike opening dual lands in their booster packs. Um, but this one is, this cycle is way different than others. So they are fetchable in formats mm-hmm. that have fetch lands. But they also, no matter what, enter the battlefield tapped. And they surveil one when they enter the battlefield. So a big question, like, talked about at least some Twitter discourse are these just definitely better than temples from like Theros block? And I'm pretty sure yes, because one, they're fetchable. Um, you know, just that alone is surveils probably better than scry considering the yeah. mechanics that we have currently in standard where that matters. Surveil adds to the collect evidence mm-hmm. um, aspect and that new mechanic in this set. Um, and it's interesting um, because when rotation and standard would happen, that is not until September, the tri lands from New Capenna all go out. And we still get basic land types in dual lands. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we've talked plenty of times about the domain deck on this podcast. And not yep. that we're going to like continue to rehash it, but we would have thought that we would have had a reprieve from basic land types, considering yes. how strong cards like Leyline Binding are. We're going to revisit this, by the way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, But now we get dual land types just from this, um, which means the domain deck is still quite playable uh, in standard, even after the tri lands go out. Um, So, yeah, more more to come on that idea. Yay. I know, right? That was it's funny because. Yeah, I know. I was looking forward to that element of rotation. You know, I know that the Leyline Binding wasn't going to go anywhere. Atraxa wasn't going to go anywhere. Herd Migration wasn't going to go anywhere. Like, the vast majority of that deck was not going anywhere. But losing the Tri-Lands makes Leyline Binding significantly slower in theory. And then these show up. And it's like, well, uh, a little bit. I mean, the the turn two Leyline Binding all of a sudden isn't happening anymore. But you're still getting on turn three comfortably. That's right. These lands entering tapped consistently is a problem, and only getting two domain or only getting two land types as compared to three 
like it is a notable downgrade, but I think the the surveil also shouldn't be discounted. I think that is a big deal, you know. And I, I'm kind of um, I'm of the opinion that surveil is just genuinely better than scry in most decks. There's some goofy yep. combo decks where you want to like tee up the bottom of your deck, and you know if you're playing like River Song Commander, sure, the temple like being able to get something to the bottom, fine. I respect that, great. But instead of like outside of those scenarios. You know, yeah, if you're not playing Grenzo or or River Song, you probably don't really care about the bottom too much. Whereas right. a ton of decks care about the graveyard. And so getting an option of just opting into throwing it into the graveyard, yeah, I think that's generally better. And being able to fetch something that can surveil. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if this honestly sees play in even timeless. You know, the, yeah. these kind of cards, because if it's it maybe it's like a one of, I mean, I definitely don't want a lot of these in the banner base, but if I've got my fetch lands doing their thing. And it's my opponent's end step, and I was just going to bring in a tapped shock anyway. Why not make it one of these and get a right. little extra value just because, you know, you know, it might be relevant. Right. And this so, is great. Um, yeah. You know, it's sort of the other piece to talk about um, in respect to, like, coming to play tap lands. Mm -hmm. um, cards from Ixalan, like Splunking, make it yep. so your lands don't come to play tapped. Right? They come to play untapped. Uh, so, you know, we might be seeing eventually a, a ramp deck that is able to take more advantage of Splunking than currently exists. Um, in which case, these just become better than Shocklands. So, in that type of deck specifically. Um, right. So, yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting to see how far along these go. I don't know how much play that these might see in some decks um, that are currently playing Trilands. Right. I think... And this is a consequence of extending standard, right? Is that we literally have the best mana base you could ask for minus fetches and standard right now. Um, so we'll see what happens here. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, these are all absolutely fantastic. Uh, yeah. And I I'm, I'm excited to get it. Well, think about, t yeah. Alongside spelunking and tortoise, like this is all just, this is cash money. I'm loving it. Imagine yeah. the tortoise reanimating the, tortoise. the surveil land. Yeah, it reanimates the surveil land. You look at the top, it's another land you, that you want for next turn. Go ahead and toss it in. Tortoise right? will grab it next turn. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, so there's going to be a lot of shenanigans with those. Speaking of shenanigans, there, there's a, a blast from the past that is returning. That is absolutely fantastic. Oh, yes. Oh, Assassin's Trophy. Is coming back to standard, everybody. If you it, don't know this card, it is. Oh, it, it, yeah. Before we gush, I need to for the folks who aren't familiar, because this came out in our last trip to Ravnica, the return to the return to the return to Ravnica. Anyway, I think it was Guilds of Ravnica, not Ravnica City of Guilds. But Assassin's Trophy, it, it first showed up. Then it was a rare piece of removal, and it became just it was the premier removal in the format, and. It's just honestly fantastic. I, I'm going to keep using that word. Instant. Black. Green. Destroy target permanent. An opponent controls. Any it's permanent? Gonna, any permanent. Yeah, you heard me. It's not <laughs> not basic permanent, not on land permanent. All of it. Its controller may search their library for a basic land card. Put it onto the battlefield. Then shuffle. So you're giving your opponent a land... But you might have just blown up a different land. So. You mean to tell me this card costs two mana? To erase anything two off the board. Two mana? Yep. So you're telling me I can destroy target Atraxa and they search for a basic land for two mm -hmm. mana? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That's great. Sounds great to me. 100%. Yeah. And I, I, I love it because there are plenty of situations where. Well, I mean, right now, how often do we find ourselves going up against the domain deck thinking, okay, I just need to grab the bes the beside you, right? Like, if I can get the two mana, destroy the landline binding, I can get my thing back, and we're going to be fine. Well, this does that. And on top of that, the beside you can't kill the Atraxa. This can, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, and incredible. so this card, this card wasn't, I think it was reprinted once in some other random reprint set. Um, I believe it. But never put back into standard. Uh, since that last trip to Ravnica. Um, I think this card, in terms of like a price point, is somewhere between like an 8 and $10 card as we speak. Right. Yeah. Um, 
but then it's going to get reprinted, and you're going to see Assassin's Trophy become maybe like five bucks or something like this, which is great. Mm. Um, I'm excited for this card. Uh, you know, certainly the Golgari deck, which is already probably one of the best decks in standard, mm -hmm. um, I would say. Um, it's very consistent. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, this just makes your removal suite better in that deck. Um, being able to play, like, cut down on one... Turn two, you have the Moss with Dread Knight and Assassin's Trophies and some number of Go for the Throats or Shieldred's Edict or whatever. Into three drops into Tortoise yeah. or Shieldred, whatever yeah. is your poison. Uh, this card is great. Um, and it's going to help combat a lot um, what that deck can't usually handle mm -hmm. in Standard. Um, and you would think even though like the green-black deck has has access to a lot, like Terra Sunder and stuff that helps deal with artifacts and enchantments... Uh, sometimes, you know, you just need to blow up the board. <laughs> uh, and th this enables you to do that. So yeah. uh, I'm very excited for this return to standard. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. And I think the key there is just the flexibility of this card. Because, yeah, you have Terra Sunder, but how often are those in your main deck? Maybe one or two? Like, you know, it's not... You put them in the right. sideboard because against the domain matchup and those kind of situations, yeah, it's huge. Mm -hmm. So you definitely want to have as many as you can get your hands on. But you could, I mean, if somebody shows me a list tomorrow and it has four Assassin's Trophy in the main deck, I'm not going to tell them they're wrong, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah, you're ramping your opponent, so there's some matchups where that might be a problem, or there might be times when you don't just want to fire this, where you easily would fire a, a Terra Sunder or a Go for the Throat, so there's yep. that. Uh, but being able to hit absolutely anything, whatever the biggest threat is, just get it off the board, That that's just... It's so flexible. There's not, there isn't a matchup where this card is ever dead, ever. It's just, even even the crazy control decks have a planeswalker as their finisher most of the time. Right. You know, like there's there's usually something on the board. People aren't going full 100% spells, um, completely, most of the time. Okay, I'm gonna try to figure out a way to make that happen now. But anyway, <laughs> there, there's always there's always gonna be a target. So yeah, Assassin's Trophy is back. Also, can we appreciate the flavor of this, by the way? It's... The artwork the artwork is showing a dead body, clearly having been killed like on the street. Mm -hmm. And there's this symbol on its chest and like some vines growing up around it in a certain pattern. And so we clearly have an assassin having, you know, executed a hit on somebody and left kind of a mm -hmm. calling card, a little trophy of their kill. Uh, pretty cool. I, I love it. It's going to be right. sick foil, that's for sure. Oh my goodness, it's gonna be it's gonna be pretty. All right. So speaking of two mana interaction, there is another card coming to standard. Uh, right now, Azorius Control is uh, the kind of deck. It's been just a staple in Magic forever, mm -hmm. but the decks in standard right now aren't quite getting there. The no the types of threats they're seeing are just a little too specific, and the counter suite they have access to, you know, you have Make Disappear, which is kind of like a better quench. Plus yep. a couple of other, you know, you have negates and you have disdainful strokes. Like the hard counters at two are all very specific. And so they're not, I don't know, that deck is kind of struggling right now. Enter No More Lies. This is an instant for white, blue. Counter target spell, unless its controller pays three. If that spell's countered this way, exile it instead of putting it into its owner's graveyard. Y'all remember Mana Leak, everybody? I miss Mana Leak so much. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. So this card is white-blue, so obviously you need to have one of each of these sources. But again, mm -hmm. hey, yo, we got the best mana ever in standard right now. Yeah, I saw it. So this ain't that hard to do. Uh, <laughs> we got fast lands. We've got tri lands. We got it all. Um, it's it's interesting. I, I think this makes the just blue-white deck more playable. Mm -hmm. In standard, right now it's like tier two, you occasionally see it. It's the Wandering Emperor dot deck that also plays, you know, like virtue of loyalty uh, as mm -hmm. a way to win. Um, that, by the way, in my opinion, should probably be getting more popular considering you could play Jace the Perfected Mind, which destroys domain. Yes. Um, but yeah, this lets you do all of this. Um, and it exiles the spell. That is huge. That means you get rid of cards that can't be Takanuma back. Um, you know, we aren't really seeing cards like Tenacious Underdog played in standard, but 
I'll be damned. It does exile that card. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure does. You know, it, it's it's super versatile. It's it's any spell. There's no restriction of non-creature mm-hmm. or creature or whatever it's got to be. Not the same full stroke. So you'll probably see some number of this being played in those decks. Uh, it's not a sideboard card. At least no. not in my opinion. Like, this is a deck you play in the main, and if you want to take this out for more hard counter spells, you know, be my guest. Um, it's it's great. Um, I'm interested to see if because it's restrictive from mana cost perspective in terms of what turns you can play it on, mm-hmm. if it won't see as much play to start. But right now, Standard is a mid-range powerhouse, right? It's a slugfest. You don't even consider control decks in the rock, paper, scissors of the format, which is no. mid range, aggro, and ramp, right? There's no right. control in there. No. Um, so it's, it, it'll be interesting to see if this now more specific um, color pied counter spell allows the blue white deck to rise up from maybe tier two to like 1.5 somewhere. Who knows? Um, mm-hmm. But definitely counter spell. I wanna, I wanna try playing in that format. Oh my goodness! I, I, yeah, I, I'm really enamored with this card, and I think we see. I mean, obviously, talking about Azorius control is kind of the the obvious place where this fits. But even, I mean, I'm thinking of Esper Tempo. You know, like okay, I'm holding up a No More Lies or a Fairy Mastermind. By your end step, I'm going to know what I needed to do. And if I can hit your right. creature, the schism, or your, you know, I mean, Shieldred, the Apocalypse, they're kind of the dream, right? If you can knock one of those out of the, off the stack with this. Holy cow. And three mana is a ton. Right now, playing around Make Disappear is doable. If I have to sandbag my Tenacious Underdog until turn four, okay, I'll make it work, you know, and that's fine. If I have yeah. to wait till turn five... <laughs> And and that, though, is another good point of, like, discussion about this card, right? Um, Because we do have Make Disappear, and Mm -hmm. it only costs one colorless and a blue to counter unless you pay two, or the casualty perspective. Um, Maybe this might be a spell that we have to wait for Make Disappear to rotate out of the format to become more playable. Um, Just because you said, you know, we can pay... We can play around it. We know mm-hmm. when we got to play around it when opponent has the ability to casualty and make me pay four. Um, but in those early turns is where this card matters more. Not mm-hmm. so much late game. Absolutely. Whereas Could make disappear imagine? has more play later right. in the game. I just I just want to be in some kind of a mirror scenario where my poor poor opponent plays a memory deluge into this. I just I want to hit that so hard. Yeah. Because it's like, yeah, you need two cards right now and two cards later. I'm not giving you any of those. Like, that just, oh, savage. Absolutely savage. So, yeah, no, this card is great, and it's definitely going to see play. But I think you're probably right. I think Make Disappear is probably going to stick around as long as those decks are, like, more consistently three-color right now. Mm-hmm. But it'll be interesting to see kind of where, where it shakes out. Yeah. And the people are going to be testing with this one on day one, I'm oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so speaking of a card that I, that uh, well, I don't think people are going to be testing with this one, but I know folks like us are going to be playing it, Slime Against Humanity. Oh, hello. That, 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 that card name is just, that's a great one, Dad. Good work. Uh, so this is a sorcery for two and a green. Create a zero zero green ooze creature token with trample. Put X one one counters on it where X is two, plus the total number of cards you own in exile and in your graveyard that are oozes or are named Slime Against Humanity. A deck can have any number of cards named Slime Against Humanity. So when you cast the first Slime Against Humanity, right, it mm-hmm. gets three plus one plus one counters, yep. right? Because you'd have one in your graveyard plus the two that it gives. So this card makes a 3-3 three, three trample for three mana. Yeah. When I play the second one, I get a 4-4 with Trample for the same amount of mana. Yeah? Indeed. Even if the first like token dies. nobody, We don't care what happens with we that. We don't care about and it. And yep. even if the Slime Against Humanity gets exiled out of your graveyard. So your opponent could even, like, your your opponent's Skidder or Graveyard Trespasser could even exile. It doesn't care. Yep. It's still counted. Yeah. This this is either going to be just super meme or it's going to be very strong. And I don't mm-hmm. know that you can say it could be in between. It has to be one of the two. <laughs> Um, 
both in draft, like if I see this card in my draft pack, I'm taking it, right? Mm. Uh, how many slime against humanities can I get unlimited? There's no way you could deal with all the oozes, right? Right. Um, so definitely a strong limited card, in my opinion. Um, in terms of standard playable, who knows? I mean, standard, again, mid-range slugfest on turn three, there's plenty of things you can be doing. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll be damned if this doesn't want me to play this card with the five mana ooze from Innistrad Midnight Hunt um, in the same deck because it cares about ooze creature types that happen to copy themselves. Yep. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm down the clown with this card. Oh my goodness, I don't even remember what that card was. But yes, well, and that one is weird because it, it's like a, it's the ooze. Consuming like, Blob. Wave. Consuming yep. Blob, that's right. Oh, I need to pull that up just because I, I, I'm sure folks do not remember this card, but it's still legal in standard. And the, the last time I tried to make this work in standard, Asika's Chariot was legal uh, mm -hmm. to give you an idea of um, how that brew went. Uh, it just became a Chariot deck. But anyway, but yeah, so this is a 5-5 five five where it's um, the number of card types among cards in your graveyard. Uh, modifies its power and toughness Tarmogoy style. But at the beginning of your end step, you make an ooze token where the power is equal to the number of card types among... Yeah, it's it's the same deal. So it splits on, on your end step, which is kind of fun, which very, very thematic with oozes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's an ooze that this can key off of uh, to do good things. Yep. In modern or older formats, you also have Eve Progenitor Ooze. I've heard a lot of people talking about doing Ooze Storm with Eve with a whole bunch of slimes in the deck. Why not? My commander deck have, can yep. have as many slime against humanities as I want. Yeah, I, I love it. I think it's really fun. This is the common in the set that I fully believe uh, is probably going to be the the two to three dollar common. You know, because when when people want it, they want twenty of them. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just so remember, y'all, don't throw your bulk away, especially not this card, because remember cards like Shadowborn Apostle and Dragons yep. Approach. Like, nope. Just keep all of the keep copies them. of this card. Mm -hmm. All of them. They, they 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 look pretty unassuming, but the people who want them want all of them. So, and people are going to be playing with this because oozes are fun. And they are. and to also point out, with the new play boosters that come with this set, there are less mm -hmm. commons in packs than Ooh. were in draft boosters. Because mm -hmm. there are now show. more uncommons. Just FYI. Yes, that's right. The more uncommons and the more rares. The uh, the flip side of that coin is fewer fewer comments. Ooh, I hadn't thought about that. So that that is gonna likely impact the price of this card. The vast majority of commons, no change. But this one, eh, keep it up. Yeah, actually, I wonder if there's gonna be a pauper deck built around this in the not too distant future. It'll be interesting to see. Oh, I also saw I, I saw a shout out on Twitter. I wish I could remember. I, I wish I remembered the original author's name. But they pointed out that it cares about exile, and they pointed out uh, surgical extraction. So if you can surgical extract your own slime against humanity, you can exile a whole bunch out of your deck. <laughs> and then the next one you cast, it's going to come in as like a 2020. Man, <laughs> surgical extraction's not on arena, huh? No, it's not. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. That's nuts. That's a whole thing. Oh, so fun, fun stuff. I think this card is going to be neat and mm -hmm. definitely has some play. All right. So we have a Planeswalker in this set. Kaya's, Kaya still has her spark, apparently, which is pretty cool. And we, we get Kaya Spirit's Justice. So this is a, a legendary Planeswalker, Kaya. Three starting loyalty for two white black. Whenever one or more creatures you control and or creature cards in your graveyard are put into exile, you may choose a creature card from among them. Until end of turn, target token you control becomes a copy of it, except it has flying. You can then plus two, surveil two, then exile a card from your graveyard. Plus one, create a one, one, white and black spirit creature token with flying. Or negative two, exile target creature you control. For each other player, exile to one target creature that player controls. So okay. we got a lot going on here. <laughs> so not some big ultimate on right. this Planeswalker, but to truth be told, Kaya never really has had like a huge ultimate ability on the majority of, of their cards. Um, you know... The plus two, surveil two, it's pretty nice, right? Mm -hmm. um, then exile a card from a graveyard. So that's important to keep all your opponent off the new collect evidence cards, yes. Absolutely. Um, which seems great. Um, also helps deal with like decks that care about reanimation strategy while you know building up your own graveyard if you want or sculpting the top of your deck. Mm -hmm. um, 
The plus one makes a 1-1 one, one white and black spirit creature token with flying, which is fine, which means Kaya also can protect herself, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it helps line up that static ability. So yep. we have another Planeswalker with static abilities. A lot of text for this static ability, by of, the way. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, you can make the token and um, the first turn, and let's say you've got, I don't know, an Atraxa in your graveyard, and you plus two and you surveil two. Then you can make your 1-1 token and Atraxa until end of turn. You don't get an ETB, but you do no. deal seven and gain seven, which, hey, seems fine to me. Right? Seems pretty good. Um, or you could even more reasonably, off a of black white deck, make a token a copy of Gix, and then you could draw a card and lose a life. And yep. it that was seems sweet. Absolutely. Um, I think I, I really like the design on this because it mm-hmm. gives you that reanimator mode where yeah, the, like the plus two being able to exile your opponent's, you know, cards out of their graveyard could be relevant in certain matchups. So nothing wrong with that. But I know the way when I look at this, I want to be using it as a reanimator, and mm-hmm. you're all, the token you target doesn't have to be a creature, so it doesn't have to be the spirit. Like if you have a clue lying around, that's fair game. You know, map tokens, blood tokens, any of that jazz, they can all become these creatures. So I love the fact that our current best reanimator targets are Trax and Natali. They do not right. synergize with Kaya very well at all because you're not getting the ETB, right. which is really the big benefit. And so we need to be a little more creative when we're playing this. And uh, the card that I want to see with this is one that probably a lot of people forgot about, uh, with good reason, um, is Rust Goliath. Do you remember this guy? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 10 10 Reach Trample. I mean, it's a 10 10 Reach Trample. Who doesn't like taking 10 off of a map token? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to tag you with my map token for right? 10 with oh, Trample. My That's. I like that. I think that's fun. Uh, so, anyway, I, that's the kind of thing I'm... That's the kind of nonsense I want to be doing with this card. Um, to give you an idea kind of where my head's at. But even so, if you are hitting an Atali, or if you are hitting yeah. an Atraxa, you're still getting seven power bodies with really sure. meaningful effects that are difficult to deal with. So, that's still fine. The other synergy here, you'll notice it's any time a creature goes into exile or a yep. creature card is exiled. You don't have to be clearing your graveyard. So, if you, like... If you have a large creature on the battlefield and you say ephemerate it, mm-hmm. well, that it's going into exile. And oh, so yeah. now you can have another creature or another you know, another token become a copy of it until in a turn. And then it comes back. You know, hmm. so that, that kind That's of thing is viable. That's pretty amazing synergy. Right? You can do some silly stuff with it, I think. Um, and so if you have a creature with like, even in like aristocrat style strategies, this is a little inefficient. It's off the top of my head. I'm sure there's a better way to do this. But if you have a, um, you know, if you have like a teleportation circle, conjurer's closet situation mm-hmm. going, where you're getting a blink every turn, if you have something with a good death trigger, you know, like a Junji or an AO, you can have a map token or a blood token become AO and then sacrifice it to something, get the trigger that goes off, and then your other AO just blinks back in. <laughs> you know, I don't know. There's there's got to be a way to. Take advantage of that. Yeah. Uh, I think it would have to be the return at the end of turn. Maybe Nahiri's Resolve? I don't know. There's something there. We gotta... But We have we have the Eternal Wanderer in true? Standard right now. I mean, granted, yeah. it's all the way up to six mana, mm-hmm. but you can plus and you can blink something out of play until end step, copy it, and yep. then it returns, yeah. Things can get silly there. Um, the other synergy here that is kind of bonkers is with Sunfall. Because Sunfall exiles the entire board and produces a token. And so the token is on the battlefield when Kaya Spirit's Justice you know, triggers. You the know, biggest, we, <laughs> the biggest we, thing that you exiled, can, so the incubator token can become the biggest thing you exiled until end of turn. Now, granted, in this case, the incubator just showed up. So unless the thing you exiled has a haste. It, you're not going to be able to swing with it right away, but it also has the counters. So if that thing does have haste, Come on. <laughs> Listen. So, so two things have entered my mind at this point. Um, number one, um, the first thing that popped into my head is playing like that Ords Off mid-range deck yep. that hasn't really rose. You see it on the ladder occasionally, but mm-hmm. you don't really see it a whole lot anymore. Um, can we talk about how many Planeswalkers right now are in Ords Off that actually make tokens from like Soren, uh, yep. 4 mana, Ashiok, 
on five that also puts things into exile. We have this Kaya. We have the Wandering Emperor. We have the Eternal Wanderer. Yep, we got um, Elspeth. We got, we've got yep. Depopulate. We've got Sunfall. We've got this new four mana Wrath that also investigates and gives you a token. Um, anybody listening to this podcast wants to make some Orzhov mid range brews? I mean, I just I just rattled off the deck for you. There um, it is. There, yeah, there it is. And you can play some cutdowns and go for the throats and stuff for early game. Preacher of the Schism makes a one one token. Um, yep. Greedy Freebooter makes a treasure token for a black mana. Like, yep. oh my god. Can it's, it's we... Here. We're yeah. brewing. We're, we gotta we're brewing, brew this baby. deck. Well, and so we're talking about Orzhov Planeswalkers. I would be remiss if I did not bring up another card from Murders of Karlov Manor that would fit into a an Orzhov Planeswalker deck. Definitely in Commander, but maybe there's something in Standard. Tomic, Wielder of Law. Have you, have, you, have you seen this? You heard about this? I've seen it. Yeah, two four, one white black, with affinity for planeswalkers, M- much like my co-host here. Um, That's me. It's fast. <laughs> flying vigilance. Whenever an opponent attacks with creatures, if two or more of those creatures are attacking you and/or planeswalkers you control, that opponent loses three life and you draw a card. So, but this card is or is not in the main set. This is in the main set. This is standard legal. Interesting. The reason that I call out Commander specifically is the affinity here, uh, it only has one generic in its cost. So the affinity doesn't really seem like it's going to be very impactful. However, affinity can help you pay Commander tax. So in Commander, if you're going really hog wild with your Planeswalkers, and Tomic oh, yeah. is your Commander, it, it could just be two mana multiple times th- as you cast him, which is pretty cool. So, yeah. Oh, I see. This card is one of the four cards that you'll get at your pre-release. Uh, oh, is, is at, in your box that you cannot use. Oh. You can't use it during the pre-release, but they are Dang. giving them out. Um, you know, while we're on like the Ords off train at the mm-hmm. moment, oh, yeah. uh, Let's go. our our friend. Um, let me find the card. Here it is. Our our friend uh, Queer Phyrexia actually previewed Treacherous Greed, which is an insane Ords off uh instant spell um <laughs> it's it's very interesting but also synergistic with like greedy freebooter doing combat damage um uh, wait tre- uh, treacherous greed treacherous greed yes okay um I don't think this card good. is an instant spell that says as an additional cost to cast the spell sacrifice a creature that dealt combat damage or de- that dealt damage this mm. turn not mm-hmm. combat damage, just damage. And then it says, draw three cards. Each opponent loses three life, and you gain three life. For three mana. So I could attack with my little treacherous thief, or my 1-1 mm-hmm. one, one token, or, uh, no, sorry, treacherous thief. Greedy freebooter. Um, or I can attack with my token. And mm-hmm. if it deals damage, even if you block it, I can still cast this card after... <laughs> Has this card after just draw to the wrath spells and the planeswalkers, and we're just having a fun time. And I gotta say, I think first strike becomes even better here because if you have like a one oh, yeah. one with first strike, I mean, the main problem with just using a small creature for this is like, okay, I attack with it, all right, I block. Well, crap, now my small creature dies before I get a chance to sacrifice it. But if you have first strike on first strike damage, thwack. Okay, then I'm going to just sacrifice it because it's now dealt damage, oh, yeah. your thing hasn't damaged it. We get to do the thing. Yeah, that's pretty great. I, I'm definitely enjoying this. And drawing three cards? Three cards. Three cards. It's cr- at instant speed. <laughs> what? what? I can even block my opponent's creature and my mm-hmm. creature not die and cast it on their turn and draw three. Yep. And yeah, it, this, it's... yeah, creatures with large toughness all of a sudden are really nice. You know, you got one of those awkward, like, one four, one fives. Yeah, okay. Like, you're going to send your 3-3 three, three and I'll block it? Sure. Imagine, By the way, I'm just sack my imagine also playing Shoulder of the Apocalypse in the deck, just gaining nine life off of a three-mana card. It's great. Why not? Well, and actually, it's funny you mentioned Shoulder because I'm realizing a lot of the time the way that people try to answer Shoulder is, like, attack in, have you block, and then respond with, you know, a damage spell or yeah. the Virtual Persistence or whatever. It's like, okay, well, if, she- if Shelly's going to die anyway... 
Uh, I'll just, you know, in combat, she dealt damage, so yes. I guess I sacrifice her, draw a bunch of cards, maybe find my next copy of, of Shieldred. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, this is really solid. Yeah. We'd this be brewing the Orzhov Orzhov deck, right so here. Sorry. I, I just find it. Apologies oh. to those on the ladder ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, be ready. This is, this is happening. So another card that might see play in that deck, maybe coming out of the sideboard, depending on your matchup, though. But whatever the case may be, Massacre Girl known killer that name alone right there makes me again wonder why are we like why are murder mysteries a big deal now but whatever so massacre girl known killer two black black for a four four with menace stats and keywords already i'm in creatures you control have wither that's a keyword meaning that if they deal damage to a creature they deal it in the form of negative one negative one counters instead of traditional damage Whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, if its toughness was less than one, draw a card. Period. I'm, I'm making a point of saying it ends there. There is no sentence saying this ability triggers only once each turn. Mm-hmm. Could you imagine if Meat Hook had still been legal in the, in this format? <laughs> uh, listen, I, 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 I hang around and play Magic with people who think that Mihook Massacre needs to be unbanned in Standard, and they are very wrong. Um, <laughs> but it's it's hilarious, nonetheless. Um, but yeah, for sure, that card with this is very insane. I, I love the fact that they've brought back the keyword Wither. Mm -hmm. um, so this existed before Infect. Be I'm talking years ago in magic um that's why infect was easier to understand when it came out because it was wither for creatures mm -hmm. or poison counters for opponent um so you know i love the fact that we have this here it also makes it so that damage isn't like cleaned up at all so like let's say you had to chump block into a shieldred the shieldred is forever minus minus mm -hmm. um which makes it susceptible to the cheaper removal like cut down um, or any type of restrictive cards based on power and toughness. Um, makes cards like Virtue, uh, the Black Virtue, a lot better. Um, you know, and can we see the return of Mono Black mid-range in Standard because of Possibly. this card? Who knows? Uh, but it, it definitely slots right in there. It's it's a 4-drop, four 4-4. Four, four. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not dying to, like, Lightning Strike. And it has Menace, so it attacks through most board states. Um, Absolutely. And that's not even talking about like the multiple combos you can play with this card in Commander. Um, you know, that's just talking about standards. Like this card is great. I'm glad that they that they made at least the return of Masker Girl, which is an iconic character mm -hmm. uh, in Magic, and gave Masker Girl actually a good card. Um, yes. So yeah, I'm excited to see this. 100%. Well, and it also synergizes, of course, with the previous Massacre Girl. We talked about Meat Hook Massacre. There's also Massacre Worm. If there's a card that has Massacre in the name, it probably works with this card. It is pretty fantastic. And this is a, the kind of deck where actually I wouldn't mind using, you know, the, the Hunted Beast we were looking at earlier to give our opponents creatures. Okay, oh, yeah. fine. If you chump, I'm drawing cards. You know, and just thinking about a mono-black aggressive situation, if I have a Tenacious Underdog and I'm attacking in with said Tenacious Underdog, if you have a 1-1, one, one, you're going to block that all day. Even if you have a 3-3 three, three or something larger, you're likely willing to block my Tenacious Underdog knowing mm -hmm. that, okay, it's going to get blitzed out later. The problem with this is now I'm withering three, and if that's enough to kill your blocker, I'm drawing cards? Yeah. I, I mean, the position of do you take this damage or are you going to help me refill my hand? And Massacre Girl on top of Gix... I mean, the opponent's damned if they do, damned if they don't. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I'm either, I either block, my thing dies, you draw a card, or you connect and draw a card. Like, oh, yeah. Ah! <laughs> it's pretty brutal. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds so like I, to me yeah. you could even play, like, a more aggressive side of Rakdos and Standard with this card. With mm -hmm. even, like, it turns your Charming Scoundrel, like, if you wanted to play that card, as a 1-1 one, one, that still is going to leave a negative one negative counter behind afterwards. Oh, yeah. Um so it makes them very playable later in the game when you draw those cheap creatures again. Oh, yeah. I think Wither is, like, shockingly powerful in formats that kind of come down to those in-the-trenches battles. And this is competing with Shadow of the Apocalypse at the four-drop slot in black. Like, that's the elephant in the room. Is this card better than Shieldred? Probably not in most situations. But there are going to be some matchups 
where this card is fantastic. And there's no reason you can't run them both. Honestly, I, exactly. Uh, yep. in, in a mono black shell where it tops out with three Massacre Girl, three Shaldred, sweet. Like, I, I'm so on board with it. Or maybe two Massacre Girl in the main, one in the sideboard or whatever. But, like, in any event, I think this card is very, very strong. And mm -hmm. it's going to see a ton of play. So, yay. <laughs> All right. Speaking of cards that are incredibly strong and are going to see a lot of play, sorry to, you know, not bury the, uh, the analysis. Archdruid's Charm. Don't worry, green mages. We got you. This is an instant for green, green, green. <clears throat> I want you to pay very careful attention to the specifics that I'm about to say here. Choose one. Search your library for a creature or land card and reveal it. Put it onto the battlefield tapped if it's a land card. Otherwise, put it into your hand, then shuffle. Next mode. Put a plus plus counter on target creature you control. It deals damage equal to its power to target creature you don't control. Or... Exile target artifact or enchantment. If this charm had any one of these modes on it, I would say it's probably playable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you've got the classic thing that green cards do. Exile or destroy target enchantment or artifact. Yep. You've got the fight spell for three green at an instant speed. Mm -hmm. And you have a ramp spell or... Worldly tutor, right? Uh, yeah. And again, at instant speed. I mean, if this, and it doesn't have to be a basic land. That's the part that blows my mind. It is any land. This is any. a three mana instant speed Sylvan scrying that goes straight to the board. Crazy. What? I mean, like, in, in standard, we're looking at, you know, domain cards. You have Mirax mm -hmm. and some of those things. Like, in the surveillance we were talking about, the utility lands in standard are fine, but yep. not likely to really, you know, cause those explosive moments. But in older formats, you know, we were talking about Valakit earlier. You have Field of the Dead in Field formats dead, like Timeless. Yeah. Like, being able to just freely grab one of those onto the battlefield. I mean, in Timeless, think about the, the Primeval Titan decks right now. Those are turn one Kamiya Bamboo Grove or Arboreal Grazer. This could be a turn three Archmage's Charm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> What is even happening? I mean, this, this is going to be insane. It's going to be insane. Commander, you can search up lands like Maze of Ith at, mm -hmm. at instant speed, um, even though it enters the battlefield tapped. Uh, any of your utility lands mm -hmm. that you might want. Um, that, I mean, that that $500 guy's cradle that totally isn't a proxy. That could. Oh, isn't. yeah. Yep. You're going to have a good day. <laughs> super, super galaxy foiled out guy's cradle. Wait. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah. That's a thing. Totally. Yeah. We can do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is insane. Uh, I, I think this card is like every with whenever you're looking at a charm, you want to make sure that one mode is gonna be just universally playable in pretty much every situation, and then one mode is gonna be like usually good removal. That's really what you want to find. You want to find yep. like a decent removal that maybe is a little below rate, and then you want to have one good mode that's just pretty good. Which is why cards like yeah. Archmage's Charm, like yes, it's just a hard counter for three. It, is three a good good rate for our counter? No, but it's also an instant speed divination. It's like, well, okay, mm -hmm. that's pretty good, you know. Or you could steal one drop. So it, yep. you know, each mode is useful in certain search circumstances, and being able to draw two cards at instant speed is never dead. Okay, great. With this one, naturalized, but it goes into exile. Like having a Terra Sunder just locked and loaded. That's great. We've talked about how good that effect is. So that all alone is worth the price of admission. You also get the bite spell. So if you're doing creature stuff, which you're green, that's not unlikely. Yep. You know, that's just playable removal. And then being able to search up any creature or land is phenomenal. There's and no I'm not sure learn. that this will look fantastic in extended art foil out of a collector booster pack. For sure, oh, right? Like it has oh, I have to. no doubt. If only there was some place on the internet where we might find somebody opening collector packs where they might be able to see what this card in extended art foil might look like. I mean, um, we we might just be doing mm. that. And, you know, sort of like inadvertent plug here. I mean, if there's ever a place you could get like collector boosters of the set, um, mm. you know, there might be this website called magicjank.com. <laughs> Wait, magicjank.com? Please tell me more. <laughs> Imagine going on magicjank.com to get your boosters, your singles, and even if you want, quiver products. Also available. Absolutely. Good stuff.
Dude, I gotta say, brilliantly done. Well, well done. By the way, I was I was subtly plugging uh, Carlos' Instagrams and TikToks and whatnot because he opens packs and they're. That's true. I do. I do. Some of the <laughs> man, I got I gotta be honest. Like you, you've got the you've got the foil like to the camera tilt like just down to a science and nailed it. Listen, they look real pretty. <laughs> whenever Ravnica remastered came out in paper, mm-hmm. you don't know this set. Oh, um, let's go. I I opened a collector box live on stream. And I got this serialized spark double live on stream. And I was like, no way. Uh, I might just have a problem opening packs, but it's fine. It's not I'm not just, really a problem. About it. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Hey, well, you know, the one hit every every few boxes totally That's makes it worth it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good stuff. All right. So the next card that I want to talk about is another. So moving away from green, because we've we've looked at a number of green cards. They're all great. Number of black cards. They're all great. Red is also getting some love in the set. We have Connecting the Dots. This is an enchantment for one and a red. Whenever a creature you control attacks, exile the top card of your library face down. Then you can pay one and a red, discard your hand, sacrifice Connecting the Dots, put all cards exiled with it into their owner's hands. Now, if you've ever played with Bowmat Courier before, you know how good that card was. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is putting the card face down down you can't look at it though which yep, is fine you don't even know what it is yes it triggers whenever a creature you control attacks so it's not just one card if you got three creatures attacking it's three cards mm-hmm. under connecting the dots so eventually when you've cast like in the mono red deck all of the spells in your hand by turn three or turn four whenever that is um, and you got nothing left but you've attacked like five or six creatures in mm-hmm. you could just pay two Discard your zero hands <laughs> and then grab a new hand. And all of a sudden, you have gas again. Um, and what's interesting is like the mono red deck, typically the cards that exile or destroy enchantments uh, aren't very good against mono red mm-hmm. at all. You don't usually yeah. sideboard any of that hate in, mm-hmm. not even for Kumano faces Kakazan. Um, right. So. I mean, that begs the choice. Are you siding an enchantment removal so I don't get a new hand? Or are you still just trying to save a life for me killing you on turn four? Mm-hmm. Um, so this card does a whole lot, a whole lot of, uh, on that turn. Um, so it would be interesting to me to see if the mono red decks in standard go wider, more three and four drops for that long game, um, or they still say stay super cheap and just are adding this card as a bonus because mm-hmm. they're going to have to cut some card in order to right. develop more card advantage. The question is, what is that card? Um, mm-hmm. You know, that means you're probably going to want to play a lot more one drops with yes. haste um, rather than like Kumano faces Kakazan. Even though mm-hmm. that card's very good, maybe you just slot four more creatures in that slot and replace connecting the dot on two. Um, right. Who knows? But that seems like a pretty, pretty good addition. Yeah, I think some builds are fluctuating a little bit, and I think Phoenix Chick has kind of fallen out of favor for some of the best of three lists. Uh, maybe that comes back, you know? And the the downside to this card, because obviously Red being able to refill its hand after they've run out of gas on, like, turn five or six, that is amazing. And for the low, low price of having attacked, <laughs> you know, like, yep. they were going to do that anyway. But spending... The, the, the notion of spending two mana... On turn two, in mono red, that doesn't deal damage is kind of wild, but that's what you want to be doing with this. So, yeah, yeah it, the, the, the downside in that deck is very real, but the upside, holy cow, is also super strong. It's yeah. still a really good follow-up to, like, Monastery Swift Spear, because you mm-hmm. will trigger the Prowess, which is nice. True. Um, yeah. But, yeah, that, that takes a turn off of you having a creature in play. Mm-hmm. I mean, for sure. Um, and then also drawing this card late game, is probably not the best. Yeah. So you win some and you lose some. Do you want to refill your gas hand or do you just continue being as fast as possible and right. lose the momentum after turn four? Um, you know, well, I think we'll see. We'll see. The board state is going to dictate a lot on whether or not it's good late in the game. Because if it's late in the game and you've got five creatures down, but you're, maybe your opponent has some blockers, but you can and you can get in for three or four damage, but it's not quite enough to, to close it. Throwing this, then attacking, getting five cards under it, cracking it, and immediately digging for that lightning strike or the plate with fire or whatever you need to to finish it off. And on top of that, too, actually. So you can, 
you attack, you let the triggers resolve, even before they declare blockers, you could crack this, open it, and maybe you have a witch stalker frenzy in there or something. You know, or some monstrous rage, or a monstrous rage, exactly. So there, I don't know. I I feel like the late game scenario is actually. Not not terrible if you have a board state. Late game following a sweeper? Oh, yeah, no, that's rough. Um, you better hope you have a mistress foundry or something just to, oh, to yeah. get a swing in. Even if it's a suicide mission, just send it on in. It's going to be something. But, yeah. But the, the top end potential on this card is really, really high. This is one where I can't wait for the grinders to really put in some numbers and determine if it's worth it or not. Because... This this could go either way. This could either be the best deck, the best card in the whole deck, or stone unplayable. I I'm not 100 percent sure, but the potential's right. there. I think I it's playable. Say. I think I it's think playable. It's, I think it's playable too. I, I do. At the very least, it's a one of. I mean, why wouldn't you? But probably a two. I'd say. I don't know. Anyway. Cool, cool, cool. Next up, speaking of aggressive red things, we have um, Ansrag, the Quake Mole. The, I don't know what the deal is with the with the Gruul clan on Ravnica, but they have just some of the most rad gods, and they're yeah. manifesting physically somehow. I'm, I love it. So yes, from the from the clan that brought you Ilhard the Razor, we have Ansrag the Quake Mole. This is an eight four for two red green. Eight four. For two red green. Let's just appreciate that for a second. Then when whenever Ansrag the Quake Mole becomes blocked. Untap each creature you control. After this combat phase, there is an additional combat phase. But wait, there's more. You pay three red, red, green, green. Ansrag must be blocked each combat this turn if able. Oh, yeah. <sighs> this card is great. It's like the perfect example of a card that you have to answer right away. Mm -hmm. If you don't kill it, you're probably dead. Um, and also interesting, you know, of course it dies. Yeah. Okay. It dies to go for the throat. Big whoop. Sure. Um, yeah. it's Nate four and it costs four mana. Um, it, it attacks through everything. Um, if it becomes blocked, you're getting more combat steps. Uh, you know, <laughs> your, your one, one that's blocking this card doesn't care. Um, mm -hmm. or this doesn't care about the one, one that you're blocking with. Um, this card, I, I think you're going to see a lot of people trying to play this card, but it is weaker to cards like Preacher uh, of the Schism mm -hmm. um, yes. because it's just a 2-4 death touch that will most certainly block this card. Mm -hmm. However, it says untap each creature you control. Not just untap Anzrag, untap yes. all the other creatures all and swing again. So if Anzrag's got to go down... For the glory of the rest of your cruel monsters that are coming in and attacking, that's fine. That's why Ansrag is the god, and Preacher of the Schism is a little vampire. Yes. Um, so you know we're 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 down for this. This is mm -hmm. this is great. Um, how I don't know how much the uh, activated ability is going to matter with this card, at least in standard, because it does cost seven. That's a huge yeah. commitment to force a block <laughs> on this card, but. One of the most common criticisms I've seen of this uh, on the Twitterverse or the sure. Xverse, whatever you want to call it now, um, has been, but it doesn't have trample. Monstrous Rage costs one red mana and gives this thing trample, and then it's a, <laughs> a it, and then it's an eleven power creature that's attacking in, um, whatever. Uh, yeah, this card is this It'll card is great. It, yeah. It's great. Oh, no, I have to find some other way. Well, and it's funny because it's so easy to get hung up on the rules text and, like, okay, how can I get, you know, make sure that I set up a block or, oh, can I get a situation where I can give, like, Anzrag Indestructible and give one of their blockers Indestructible so that they have to block repeatedly and I get infinite combats. Yeah, those kind of, like, weird janky setups are fine and they're fun. Okay, neat. We have a new rule text box toy that we can play with. Great. Can we it's also talk about Inti? Yes, Inti, exactly. But it's also just a, it's an 8 4 for 4. What more do you want? <laughs> like... I can tell you what card it doesn't die to, and that's the two mana uh, uncommon, can't be countered, destroy target creature with power three or less, or whatever it is. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, the, the long goodbye, I think, is the name of that new card. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it most certainly doesn't die to that card. Oh, yeah. Um, so Good the luck. question it is 
Doesn't die to lightning helix, which is also a new one that's that's going to be coming back. A new old one that is. Uh, so the back. question is, how many yep. of the cards actually in this set, from even a limited perspective, actually even touch this card? Which is probably not much. Not much. Um, oh, you might get your random like common exile target creature spell for six mana or something right. like this, right? That like you have in every set. Yeah, one of those, absolutely. Oh, but you, I mean. I'm thinking that, you know, Jund with doesn't add up, like, it reanimated on your end step, it comes back as a suspect, like, the stuff you can do with this is just absolutely obscene, and we were mentioning fight rigging earlier, we also have things like Skullspore Nexus that care about power, I mean, if power is gonna matter on creatures, it, you need to get an obscene amount of it in an efficient package, and that's exactly what this is. Mm. You know, if the opponent has a blocker, okay, great. I just get more yeah. combats. I just get to smack you again. All right, so this is practically unblockable, you know, in all situ in most situations, unless you have death touch. But even mm -hmm. then, like you're saying, you still get a free second shot with everything else. Sure I do. mean, yeah. It, Imagine, it's gonna like, nice. attacking, like, if you're playing a Jun deck, let's say, just some, like, Jun midrange just shenanigans. I mean, playing playing Inti on two into Glissa on three into this creature on four, um, you know, being able to put a, a counter and give trample to this card with Inti, or even if they block this card, then untapping with Inti plus your three drop mm -hmm. and swinging it again, like huh? yeah. All of this seems very good. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's one of those scenarios where it, it, you know, detractors would look at this and go, oh, but they'll just have the sunfall like, every time. And if they do have the sunfall, how likely are they to rip it when they see Inti and Glissa on the field, assuming they can at that point? Probably mm -hmm. pretty high. You know, like that's yeah. not a bad time to use a sweeper. So I don't know. I, I feel like this is one of those must answer threats. And the difference between this and a lot of other must answer threats out there is this is delivering an eight power shot directly to your face, mm -hmm. you know, every turn, maybe multiple times a turn. If you don't answer it, I mean, this will just straight kill you if you don't, if you, if you can't remove it. And that's great. Our, the must answer yeah. threats need to do that. And that's what this does. So I dig it. Yeah. Answering the, the quake mold. If I make a new, commander deck out of things we've seen so far that's probably going to be it if i'm for honest. sure <laughs> <laughs> all right cool 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 so uh moving on to the next card that i want to talk about this card actually just got spoiled today as of this recording leyline of the guild pact i'd be remiss if we didn't the, talk about this leyline of the what now Leyline of the Guild Pact. So you can spend... So this is has a weird hybrid mana cost. I'm going to do my best to explain it. You can spend four green or one of every non-green color, but they're all hybrid. So you can do any combination thereof. So you, you can do... So it's hybrid green-white, hybrid green-blue, etc. All the way down the way. So a total mana value of four. But if it's in your opening hand, you may begin the game with it on the battlefield. So classic ley line text where you could just get it for free. And it says each non-land permanent you control is all colors. Hey, maybe I can actually get a win with um, Once Upon a Time. Or not Once Upon a Time, uh, with Happily Ever After. Okay, sweet. Yeah. Lands you control are every basic land type in addition to their other types. Okay, now that one... Yeah, one of these type or one of these rules lines is really good, and the other is f here too, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> this has had a lot of discussion on Twitter mm -hmm. today. Yeah, from when it was spoiled, there yeah. is like a nice little meme going around that has a, a, a black box over top of the text of this card, and it says "Do nothing," right? Um, and then there are people that are. Also saying that this card is absolutely bonkers, crazy mm -hmm. card, can't believe this is only a rare. Um, so let's talk about the reality of this mm -hmm. card, right? Because you could just be of the camp that say, oh, well, this card's just not playable in standard. If you're coming from it from a standard point of view, it costs four mana or it's free. You're probably never wanting to pay four mana for this card, which is probably true. You yeah. probably don't want to be playing four mana for this card. But... What it does enable is for you to be able to play, let's say, in the domain deck, Leyline Binding on turn one. Most people ain't playing Leyline Binding on turn one. There's, mm -hmm. there's, there's no deck you're playing against that requires you to do that. 
right? You probably right. would be better off playing another spell. Um, but it making every land that you have, every basic land type, is relevant in a deck like Domain. Because what you are typically ramping for is to try to hit that double white for your Wrath spell, mm -hmm. while at the same time trying to have double green for Topiary Stomper to ramp. Um, and it then enables you to have double blue to be able to play currently Jace, uh, Perfected Mind, or quadruple green for Nyssa, Ascended Animist, right? Yep. So it makes all of those things easier to do. Yes. So that's sort of point one. Mm -hmm. uh, point two is there are other formats outside of just standard where this card cares about, right? You could play cards like, I don't know, Valakut the Molten Pinnacle, which now everything becomes a mountain from the start of your game, uh, if you happen to start with it out, right? Um, it, it also matters for um, any type of multicolor commander deck that is able to play five colors, like, you probably want a copy of this, right? Because all your mana's fixed from the start of the game. So, yeah, it can be a commander card oh, yeah. um, that you certainly can... I wouldn't mind paying four mana for this to fix my mana for the whole game. We oh, already pay, this, three, yes. pay three mana for Chromatic Lantern, right? Um, right? So cards like... And seven mana for Chromatic Orrery. So, like, this card, <laughs> exactly. this card seems fine um, mm -hmm. for all of those things. Um, it... it I, I think it's a decent card. I don't mm. think it's extremely overpowered. I certainly don't think it's a do-nothing card. Right. Um, but it's it's reasonable. So I think being at rare is reasonable for the card. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether or not this card is relevant in, like, limited. Likely not. This is, like, a 0.0. Yeah, 0. I'm not yeah. taking this card drafting mm -hmm. or playing in sealed or something like this. Unless I just want to be greedy and play all the colors, which is, hey... If, if you know Isaiah MTG, you know that he likes to draft his five color decks, and this would fit right in to help fix that mana. Um, There's a time and a place for that, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know. What what are your thoughts? I, I'm, I agree with everything you said. I mean, like, in five color commander, absolutely. Like, just the fixing alone is worth it. You know, I have two five color decks. Both of them would absolutely make room for this. Um, and I also find it funny, the... the um, you know, your non-land permanence being all colors isn't super effective, but now none of your creatures died a doom blade. That's kind of fun, right? Anyway, because that's totally relevant these days. But in any event, on the land fixing is huge. And you mentioned Valakit, and in standard, we also have Koth, the new format of Koth from um, Phyrexia, <clears throat> all be one. And it has the, the emblem on Koth, which is not that hard to get to, honestly, if you can protect him. Um, uh, that emblem is the Valakut ability, where when a mountain enters, you get to dome something for four. And so if you can get to that emblem, now all of your land drops are an obliterating bolt that can go phase. I mean, that's bananas. And we also have a lot of cards that can get a lot of, you know, lands onto the battlefield at once. So all of a sudden, doing a weird Valakut kind of thing in standard is possible with this. I don't know that it's going to be good necessarily, but you better believe I'm going to try it, because why not? Yeah, right? why not? Yeah. I think it's neat. I like this card. I like it a lot, actually. And I think the, mm -hmm. the do nothing, there are the vast majority of decks, this does nothing. That's correct. But if you're yeah. juggling a lot of colors, having a couple of these might be worth it. And you know, yeah. I, 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 I saw some people post about how, in terms of like other formats, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the Velika argument, but also like Scion of Draco which cares about your basic land types, yep. right? I'm pretty sure you can still play that card on turn two in Modern without this card, but this helps enable it uh, if you play it to start the game. Like, for sure, guaranteed, mm -hmm. you've got it all. Um, Love it. But it, you know, could be relevant in that deck. I dig it. I dig it. All right. Next up, we have Outrageous Robbery. This is an instant for X black black target opponent exiles the top X cards of their library face down. You may look at and play those cards for as long as they remain exiled. If you cast a spell this way, you may spend mana as though it were mana of any type to cast it. Yeah. All right, what are your thoughts? I love this card. Not just because it's one of those X spells that let me cast my opponent's spells. Um, because you know we all love a good w villainous wealth. 
Okay. Even though it let, lets you cast the cards for free. Um, but Outrageous Robbery reminds me a lot of Decadent Dragon from Wilds mm. of Eldraine. Mm -hmm. Because on Decadent Dragon's adventure side, it lets you pay two and a black, and it exiles the top two cards of your opponent's deck face down. You can look at them, and you can play them anytime. Um, it's... It's interesting because <laughs> uh, this lets you do black, black, X. So if you're playing like the current Rakdos ramp deck that exists in standard, mm -hmm. not biased totally at all because I, I love playing that deck. Um, this lets you do that at a greater capacity and mill more cards out of your opponent's deck. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason the Rakdos ramp deck plays Decadent Dragon is because it helps mill them, helps mill the domain deck. Um, the domain deck is super susceptible to getting milled it might be strong mm -hmm. but it can't be getting milled out right. so you know by the time you play a card like this and breach the multiverse and the deck in a dragon size i'm not saying go and run and play four copies of this card in your deck but you probably should have like two in there mm -hmm. somewhere that would be reasonable um and it lets you of course uh keep up the tempo by playing your opponent's threats and saving yours they can't yeah. counter and remove everything. Certain not, certainly not things in both players' decks, um, <laughs> you know. And there is technically in standard an infinite mana combo that exists, but nobody really plays it. Um, right. With like the fairy, the one mana fairy from from Wilds of Eldraine, the Kami yeah. uh, that taps for mana, and Agatha Soul Cauldron. Um, so you could just mill your opponent out with this X spell. That's totally possible, too. It will involve a lot of clicking uh, on Arena. <laughs> Th that's one of those decks where I I wouldn't be surprised if some variant of, like, a Saltai combo deck revolving mm -hmm. around that happens in paper and we don't see it on the ladder. Yeah. Because, the, yeah, that would just not... I mean, it would have to have a really high win rate for somebody to do something like that on, oh, the, yeah. uh, on Arena. Because, yeah, the timer is going to prevent you from doing that. But you're right. Once you get infinite mana, this you just draw your opponent's entire deck. Mm -hmm. And then you pass the turn and you call it a day. So that's nutty. Yeah. Yeah, this card is great. Not to I mention it's already, it. like, nutty in Commander. So oh, yeah. Yeah, way that's... more infinite mana strategies there. Thankfully, it says target opponent, and it doesn't say each opponent. Oh, could you imagine? But, yeah, but even then, even in the early game in Commander... Yeah, like how funny is it if your opponent is like, all right, on your end step vampire tutor, cool, that resolves. Before we move on, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna hit just hold, out and just drop hold up on a you for, minute. <laughs> for one or two. Like, all right, sweet. <laughs> I, I love it. Well, and I love the mention of it against the domain deck specifically. I think that's gonna be one of the spots where it's weakest. Like you want or where it's strongest, rather. So even if you're doing like a mono black aggro strategy that maybe mm -hmm. doesn't want something like this. Having them in the sideboard as kind of the secret tech to deal with the domain list specifically. Because if you can hit this and and remove five, six cards out of out of the domain player's deck, that's yep. a meaningful hit. And then on top of that, there's a non-zero chance that you draw into the Sunfall or whatever that's going to help you deal with their herd migrations. Yep. You'll love to see it. So, yeah, this kind of feels like, you know, a lot of the time Jace Wielder of Mysteries comes in. At, or not Wielder, Wielder of Mysteries, sorry. Perfected Mind, Perfected the one we mind. actually have. Yes, Jay's Perfected Mind comes in as tech against domain quite a bit, especially in the domain mirror and things. And I feel like Outrageous Robbery can kind of fit a similar role in decks that have access to black. So yep. it's pretty cool. Yeah, and honestly, just the, that amount of card draw f for a relatively low cost at instant speed, sign me up, I'm in. <laughs> All right, next up I want to talk about Deadly Cover-Up. This is a black sweeper. Three black black for sorcery. As an additional cost to cast a spell, you may collect evidence six. Destroy all creatures, period. If evidence was collected, exile a card from an opponent's graveyard, then search its owner's graveyard, hand, and library for any number of cards with that name and exile them. That player shuffles, then draws a card for each card exiled from their hand this way. More wrath spells. Um... <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> well, what's interesting about it is if you can't collect evidence, it still wipes the board for five mana. Fine. Great. Yep. You need that If sometimes. you can collect evidence, then you the end uh, <laughs> creatures out of your opponent's deck. Um, it's it's kind of crazy. And yep. I'm glad that they printed this at rare. Um it, it gives the red-black decks 
that ramp deck. Yep. A better card than burn down the house. Right. Um, Cause burn down the house is restricted by damage, right? To do that wrath. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, Black doesn't need any more of these cards, it please. Not. I don't understand. Correct. I don't understand this, especially if this was taken into consideration. We were extended standard three years. Not only do I get to play the Orzhov deck that lets me play all the white sweepers, but also all the black sweepers. <laughs> it's not necessary, but here we are. Yeah. Um, it's it's a great card. It does get rid of your one of your opponent's threats if you're able to collect that mm-hmm. evidence. <clears throat> collect evidence well, six is not difficult, right? Not really. Well, and the other thing I want to point out is you exile a card from their graveyard. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be a creature. And you can find any number. There are no restrictions on the card that you can exile. Right? So if you're going up against, say, a mono blue deck, let's assume we're, you know, and this somehow resolves, which sure. is a b- big hypothetical. But let's say we're going up against mono blue. Well, and early in the game, they played a consider and surveilled away an island. You can now remove every island from their deck. It's true. Which and it's means, dirty. To be fair, like in that situation, that's the ultimate deck thinning, and they're going to draw action for the rest of the time. So if they have lands, if your opponent's been getting mana screwed, that is like, you know, they, they let one go and it was a mistake or something, or you forced the discard and they dumped another. I don't know, whatever. Mm-hmm. But like, you can do some really nasty stuff with this. On top of that, you're uh, if they have a spell in there that you're really concerned about, a particular counter spell that you know is going to have your number if it's allowed to, mm-hmm. you know, crop up again, get rid of it. You know, going up against the domain deck, if you know if they have a leyline binding in there that you blew up earlier, you can just get all those out of there, remove the obviously attracts and whatnot. So yeah, don't the the um, collect evidence six is going to be pretty easy to do. So right now out there, if you have a deck that has a card like Terror Tide. In your sideboard, this, in my opinion, just immediately replaces that. It's not even yep. close. Because, yeah, it, it does a cleaner job of getting rid of creatures. And if you were going to be descending and filling your graveyard anyway, that Collect Evidence 6 is going to be easy to pull off. So, yeah, sweet. Get after it. Car- I, 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 think I, can't, this- I can't wait to cast this against Domain and Exile the Herd Migration so they lose that win condition. Oh, because you know that's going to be in their graveyard, too. That is such a clean answer to that. Oh, love it. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Phenomenal. I actually come to think of it, these last couple of cards that we've seen are phenomenal against Domain. So maybe that, maybe that deck is going to gonna take a hit. Maybe. So, hmm. We'll see. All right. Next up, we have we have a new Sphinx, everybody. Uh, this card, I think, is interesting. This is Conspiracy Unraveler. This is a 6-6 flyer for 5 blue-blue. You may collect evidence 10. Rather than pay the mana cost for spells that you cast. This is a goofy mythic from this set. I just wanted to mention it here. I firmly believe it is going to see zero standard play. But I can't help but be intrigued. If you're going a hard mill reanimator strategy where you've got a bunch of big chunguses. That collect evidence 10 is not going to be terribly hard. Yeah, but so, this card ca- costs seven to get out. Oh, yeah, you have to cheat it out so you can cheat other things out. <laughs> so you're saying I have to, like, play Squirming Emergence with this card? Yes, that's And exactly you have you to, like, Squirming Emergence this out first. Mm-hmm. And then, because you've milled so aggressively to, to satisfy the Squirming Emergence or get the Squirming Emergence going, you can then collect Evidence 10 to cast the Breach the Multiverse that's in your hand. And then once you've breached the Multiverse, you fill the Graveyard again, so then you can collect Evidence 10 to, you know, hopefully you draw some more cards. Yeah, I, I feel like there might be something here. Like, it's goofy. It's weird. I don't think it's competitive. Yeah. But the, the top-end jank... I mean, we're on the Magic Jank podcast. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the janky omniscience they gave us. <laughs> so... Yeah. I yeah. I don't know how I feel about this card. Um, we're, What's going to probably happen is, like, I'm totally wrong on it, and it's, like, super good, because that's how these cards end up being. Right. But, um, yeah. I don't, I don't know. I don't know that I would want to score an emergence this card when I can score an emergence, like, a card that's going to win the game. Um, Fair. Or at least that's the idea of that type of a deck, right? Sure. Um, yeah. Seven mana is doable in terms of, like, ramp decks, like, ramping mana to get mm-hmm. to seven. Um, 
But you better have some protection because once your opponent kills this creature, that strategy is yeah. out the door. I also find the artwork really funny because it's showing the Sphinx and there seems to be this like big spectral kind of uh -huh. glowing thing in front of them, which I think is supposed to be some kind of like diagram that they're, you know, working on kind of minority report style. Mm -hmm. But it kind of looks like a glowing shield that is very similar to like the shield token that you see or the shield counter that you see on right. Arena. So it looks like it should have ward or something, but it way does it. But it does it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. No, I agree. Yeah, so I think that's kind of funny. I don't know. I think the card's goofy. It's not going to see any competitive play, in my opinion, but it's a fun setup, and I'm mm -hmm. going to try to do stuff with it. Alongside Breach the Multiverse and Natali and things like that, it's just another, you know, it's another little cherry in the slot machine that, yep. you know, that you can find. So, all right. And then the last card that we want to talk about for today is one that I think, on the opposite end of the spectrum, is going to see a lot of play, at least coming out of sideboards in competitive environments. Doorkeeper Thrall. This is a 1-2 for 1 and a white. Flying. Creature Thrall. With artifacts and creatures entering the battlefield don't cause abilities to trigger. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. So, it stops ETBs for 2 mana. Mm -hmm. So, outside of this in standard currently we have Elish Norn that does this for right. 5 mana. Right? Mm -hmm. Elish Norn is also a 4-7. And doesn't die to cut down, but this card can. Yep. Um, for the time being. Right? Um, but this, yeah, stops artifacts and creatures. Mm -hmm. So, I guess for most artifacts to have ETBs, like your cheap interactive artifacts that do this, right? So, what does that affect currently? I mean, you got the Heart of the Dusk Rose, which doesn't see a ton of play, but it's out there. You've got, okay. I mean, in older formats, you have Portable Hole and um, yeah, and Glass Cat. Oh, Glass Casket is Glass uh, Casket. still standard. So you get those. Um, Mightstone Weakstone uh, all of a sudden gets shut off by this. Oh, so, sure. Uh, you know, there the is... fact that it doesn't touch enchantments really hurts because yeah. then all of a sudden Leyline Bindings, Beanstalks, all that stuff still happens, which is mm -hmm. a little bit of a bummer. But There is like a blue-white artifacts deck in standard. Mm -hmm. Um, that this deck, this card <laughs> kind of poops on. Um, but like maybe only that deck. I don't know. Yeah, but the fact that it impacts creatures, you know, if the opponent taps out to play an Atraxa or an Atali, granted, you still have the body to deal with, like we were talking about earlier. But this does, at, you know, you can surprise ambush this in. And deny them all the card draw that maybe they were counting on, or those free casts off mm -hmm. Atali that they desperately needed. So this shuts those down. Notably, unlike other cards like Strict Proctor or Hushbringer, this doesn't you know combo with lands either. So it doesn't impact the, the Lotus Field kind of combo decks. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. Um, you know, and again, it doesn't touch uh, enchantments, which is a huge knock against it as far as this effect is concerned. But man, in the matches where this is good, that's going to be really yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I. I mean, I think this is a fine card. Um, mm -hmm. it's respectable. It's not overpowering because it can die to real cheap removal. Um, it also is a, a nice cheap flyer, uh, to attack with. Mm -hmm. Um, it's definitely limited playable. Oh yeah. hundred percent. It's probably something like a five out of 10 on a constructed perspective. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think all around it's a great card. Um, you know, I, I can imagine the Esper decks or the Soldier decks running these at least as a couple in the sideboard mm -hmm. because those decks are keeping mana open to flash in your Resolute Reinforcements. You see, oh, yeah. like, Esper decks with the Fairy Mastermind still and then also Counter Magic. And so having this as an alternative, you know, if they play a creature that has an Enter the Battlefield trigger, well, rather than... Oh, in the Bant uh, Toxic deck, Annex Entry. You know, that mm, being yeah. able to shut that down, that could That's be right. huge. So if the opponent throws an Annex Entry, then you could, you okay, I could counter it on the stack, or I could just throw the Doorkeeper Thrall, prevent that, that card from being meaningful, mm -hmm. um, and then also have another body online that can be attacking back at you next turn, or block another thing that you have coming at me. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think uh, there, there are places for it. There's utility for this, and... Yeah, I think I think a lot of decks that currently exist could take advantage of this, mm -hmm. and it'll be interesting to see. Again, it'll be interesting to see if the meta shakes it out and deems it now ready the, in the end. Man, the blue light blue light deck has this plus tide binder to stop Atali now. Oh yeah, no, it, yeah. Oh damn it! 
Atali's never triggering again. I'm sorry. I'm bummed and too, the man. Carnosaur. Never again. <laughs> Daggers. Yep. All right. It's fine. Yep. Well, we're just gonna have to we're just gonna have to ramp and flip him. You know, that's just this is what you gotta do. Yeah. But yeah, so all in all, um, this set is looking to have quite a few cards that might impact the the current meta, which we've seen the last few sets in standard have definitely shaken things up pretty dramatically, while also giving us all kinds of fun tools for for commander as well. So I don't know before we before we um, you know sign off for the day. I'm just curious, kind of what are your final thoughts on the cards we've seen so far? We've seen the vast majority of the set at this point, but not everything. Hmm. Well, I could tell you one thing. Um, considering discourse, I've seen not people like hating on the set, but claiming that, that the cards in it are not as powerful as some other cards from previous sets. Mm -hmm. I I don't agree with the sentiment that the set isn't great because power level of some of the cards are less. We've enjoyed having lots of extremely powerful cards printed into standard that affect other formats. Um, I think it's clear with so far what's been spoiled, what cards definitely make a standard impact versus what doesn't, um, or that what can be playable in other formats versus what doesn't. And that doesn't mean that the card has to be like absurdly powerful. Um, what I don't like to see is something I've mentioned already. We've got at least two wrath spells in this set. With a three-year standard, we don't need that. Mm. Um, I don't know what the idea behind that was. I'd be curious to find that out. That that being said, um, I enjoy the majority of the cards from the set. I think it's going to be an interesting uh, set via a limited perspective because it's adding three huge mechanics to what will be a pre-release that some people have played with before right different modified versions of these mechanics such as mm -hmm. the morph disguise versus the um suspect i think that's going to be hard for people to understand or keep track of at the pre-release um okay. just because yeah. of the way it is um but i think it's 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 interesting how versatile that mechanic is um it definitely satisfies the need for like a murder mystery perspective um, I love the storyline. I love the lore, like reading the lore, like who done it. I tell you, the person who done it, and I won't spoil it here. Y'all can go read the story for that. Was not somebody I expected <laughs> when they revealed it. Um, but it 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 definitely was, I think, a, a, an okay design set. Um, I'm I'm always curious to see what makes the major standard impact. Mm -hmm. um, you know. I would love to see a return to where a mono green deck becomes playable in the format, not just because of yeah. the charm, but some of the other cards don't get played as much simply because they're in that color pie um, or part of the lower end of the color pie, however you want to call that. Um, but I'm excited for the set and I'm excited to play in the pre-releases. Um, I, like many other players, I learn how the mechanics work literally from playing at the pre-release or Something like this. If I could play it with it in a limited perspective, then I can understand it from a, a constructive point of view. So um, I'm excited. And the pre-release is in what? Two weeks? Oh, Less than two like weeks that. now? It's coming up, yeah. Something like that. Not this weekend, but the weekend after. Um, so I, I'm excited. Um, <laughs> I'm excited for this. And Ravnica has always been like a popular plane, so should maybe see some returning magic players who haven't played in a little bit just to see what their old favorite character is up to and whether or not they're dead. Uh, cause that matters in this set. <laughs> so, uh, I, I'm ready for it. I, I enjoy the set thoroughly and, um, we'll see how I feel in two weeks when we start playing with it in standard, um, yes. and seeing if anything has changed. Yeah. I can't, I can't wait. Cause the, I think, what, the power level that we've seen, it seems on par with what we already have, which is not always the case. And I, and I know from past experience, even very recent past experience, sometimes the, the movers and shakers we can spot, sometimes not so much. I mean, I'm pretty sure if you go back and look at, you know, any of our Lost Caverns, um, you know, spoilers, Deep Cavern Bad, I think a lot of people were, were saying, yeah, it's pretty good. This might, this might see some play, but... 
it's been the guy. <laughs> really, like, it's been, you know, Preach with Schism, we, I think we knew. Trumpeting Carnosaur is like a top head. Okay, I'm pretty sure we, like, I think we got that one right. But yeah, the bat was kind of an underdog. So what is that from this set? What is the the card that maybe the uncommon that maybe we touched on and we're like, it's interesting, or maybe we just didn't even include it here yeah. because we, we didn't expect an impact. And it comes out that those are the ones that always get me the surprises that, you know, um, step up and become big players. So I'm excited to see what those are from this set. And all in all, though, I think I think it's good design. I agree, but they could probably take a, a few sets off from Wrath Effects in general. Right, right. I, I feel like there's a checkbox where they're just like, okay, we need a rare dual land cycle. We need, you know, the two mana kill a thing with some caveat. We need the five mana reanimator with sets mechanic. We need like. And those that check I mean, to be fair, that checklist has produced some amazing limited environments. Yep. So maybe there's some merit to it. But I don't know. Do we need a rare sweeper in every single set? I think that's yeah, it's a bit much. But give us give are. us a, a a bounce spell, a mass. Give us evacuation back in Classic. standard cowards. Exactly. Yes. You can come do on. It. You, it. you can you can do it. Evacuation. We don't need Psychrift. Evacuation. Yep. Classic. Return all creatures to their owner's hands. I love it. Let's make that happen. Oh, that'd be so good against Domain right now. Anyway, yeah, nice beast you got there. Whoop. All right. In any event, with that thought, let's just all savor that for a minute as we bid you all a very fond adieu. We will be back next week to look at the last couple of spoilers and then talk about anything that happens between now and then as we get prepared for the pre-release and we are um, and we head into Murders of Carlo Manor. So, yeah, Carlo, thanks so much for joining me. Always a pleasure. And, yeah, please, if you're on the YouTubes, please like and subscribe. If you're listening to this on your podcast app of choice, Please leave a review and uh, tell a friend. It would actually really help to let uh, yeah. folks know that we're out here doing the thing. Yeah, yeah, we are. Also, if you have any questions for us, feel free to join our Discord server. The link for that is in the description. We do check that out. And, uh, yeah, if you fire in any questions, we will answer them directly on air. So, yeah, looking forward to that. So thanks oh, yeah. so much for everybody. We'll catch you on the next one. See you later. See you later.